Well, it's 12 o'clock, and I know Doug does a thousand things over there, so I'm going to get the ball rolling. If people join in, we can certainly, you know, they can they can see what's going on. Doug, I assume you're going to be sharing some stuff on your oh, yeah. screen today? Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, I asked Doug to join us today. Uh, Doug Adams, I think you guys all know Doug Adams, uh, head of R&D, research and development in the county right now. Um, luckily not building, otherwise he might have paintballs all over him. Um, but basically, uh, he we brought him in today because one of the priorities that has been set forth by the executive committee uh, is to grow and attract, grow, attract, and retain businesses that further diversify our economy in sustainable ways. And I figured since that is pretty much what I, I mean, maybe you can clarify, but that seems to me what R&D is focused on, that you'd be perfect to be able to share with us what you guys are doing, how we might be able to partner and how we can help help each other push this island forward. So the floor is yours, Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, I always wonder what that phrase means in a virtual setting, but that's fine. Um, a little intimidated by this group, um, to be honest with you. It's um, folks that uh, could easily doing, be doing this as opposed to me, but um, there you are. So I'm going to be stealing from a variety of sources, some of which some of you have seen, as it turns out. So um, but that's okay. Uh, you know, when you've got folks like Paul Brubaker that um, is giving you slides so that you can give what truth looks like, according to Paul, then that's always um, necessarily a good thing. Oh my God, Jackie Hoover has joined us. Okay, so um, Keith is uh, accurate in the sense of we are in the county and particularly in the department looking to, to work on a variety of ways to um, diversify our economy. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll start with the um, kind of the presentation that I did actually for the Hawaii Island Realtors um, piece. And I'll walk through that briefly um, so that uh, that kind of talks about where we were at. So let's see, there's that. Let me see if I can show that relatively easily. There's that screen. All right, hopefully, can you all see, it should say County of Hawaii Research and Development, County and the Economy, is that what you see? Yes, okay, great. All right, so let's move on down. Oh, yeah, so uh, Mary can laugh at this one. Mary was there, she saw that. So when we were talking about, obviously, the economy, what it means, um, the things that matter for us, um, part of this has to do with where the county has an impact, right? So obviously in employment, um, the funding, the ordinances and regulations, priorities, particularly for infrastructure, um, real property tax rates and assessments. The priorities that we're actively working on in the county right at the moment, affordable housing, not a surprise, um, wastewater and solid waste, um, which if you're, most of you I think are aware that we are under a um, consent order um, with the EPA to um, get rid of the cesspools as soon as possible. We, there is a statute on the books, of course, that gives us um, a little bit of leeway in terms of the amount of time, but climate um, issues associated with this and particularly the data that's being collected in terms of the impacts on our coral reefs um, around the island are indicating that maybe we we, we need not wait that long. So there is work that's being done in that regard. Um, sustainability as a, as a whole, and then revitalization, diversification, renewable energy and climate, ag and food security and community well-being. So let me just give a brief, I was hoping that at a meeting like this, I would be able to say how excited we were that we had um, received funding from the federal government in the millions of dollars that was gonna allow us to move forward with our Build Back Better Regional Challenge applications. But unfortunately, that was not the case. So we were, were one of 60 out of uh, 529 coalitions that were awarded um, phase one uh, grants in December of, of 2021. And then in uh, the beginning of this month, just a week ago, uh, 21 of the 60 were selected by the Economic Development Administration Department of Commerce um, as recipients of these larger um, amounts. We are waiting to find out feedback on the um, from the EDA 
uh, on you know what it is that um, caused us, frankly, not to be selected. Um, and but at the same time, through this entire process from from December to this point, the EDA and their advisors, their their team, America Achieves and and others um, have been very focused on making sure that all 60 um, phase one recipients, awardees, understand that, that they're all going to be, we're all going to be supported as we move forward with um, these efforts. So although we didn't get the amount um, initially from the federal government, which the idea is that the work that's being done in agriculture um, by the Agricultural Coalition, um, which was a real get for us to, to develop that and to, to be able to lead that as we move forward. Um, that effort will continue. The missions are still there for us to work on. And so we're gonna continue to do that. It just means that with less funding, things begin to move to the right. And so we will continue to, to see what is out there, whether it's USDA, whether it's other EDA, um, whether it's uh, even some of the climate related funding that came out of the IRA that may be able to connect um, to some of the missions that we have ongoing. We'll see how that all kind of um, uh, pans out as we move forward. So let me just move this. I don't need to talk about this at the moment. Um, okay, so Big Island profile, we talked about this, 4,000 square miles, population 200,000. Um, as all, everybody in this um, group knows, uh, the combination of our Alice populations and our households in poverty are around the 50%, if not more, as a result of COVID. That plays a big part in the things that we think about um, when we're talking about our economy and um, equity concerns as associated with that. Um, and unemployment rate was at one time the 5.2. It's uh, For this county right now, it's around 4%. But we'll talk about that because I have some concerns about that number as well. So of interest, we have 200,000 registered vehicles. I always think that's interesting. Um, uh, just like Oprah says, a car for you and for you and for you, right? So um, um, you can be a day old um, or a month old or 92 years old. Everybody's got a car. That's great. Um, what that means, of course, is that the, the costs associated with that, um, $1.7 and then around 39 million in terms of the cost of air pollution. The other piece I would identify is this particular chart, this eye chart that's over here on the right-hand side. What that represents is how far, what's the distance to go to work. Um, and so this is a 2015 um, chart, but at that time we had around 36% traveled more than 50 miles to get from um, their home to their place of work. Um, and then less than 10 miles was around 44, 45%. So um, we're, this is not a surprise, I think, to any of us. We know that we, we have a bedroom community kind of commute situation, particularly for work that's being done on the west side when we're talking about folks that live in the southern part or the eastern part of the island, and to some degree even in the Hamakua area. And then finally, when we're talking about the uh, climate action piece, transportation is the huge piece for this. This is, this is I wouldn't say, unique is probably the right, not the right term, but it is certainly um, an aspect of our island that, that we are paying attention to, meaning that when we think about the emissions that are being um, uh, put out by uh, you know, our economy, by, by us, Transportation is responsible for nearly 58%, nearly 60%, as opposed to, in a lot of cases, the industrial or commercial energy side of things. So that's why there's a big focus by the county on electrification of transportation um, as we speak. Okay, and so when it comes to that, we're looking at our fleets um, uh, and the ability for our um, county fleets to, in fact, um, be more EV and at some point even hydrogen fuel cell. There's a lot of work that's going to have to be done to make sure, particularly in the hydrogen side, that we have the the um, fueling stations and the distribution of the, um, uh, the 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 sources for making hydrogen as a part of the vehicles. All of that stuff is going to be important. The um, the key here for us though is that we're going to start with the county. We are already are working with. Um, some of the departments like Parks and Rec and Public Works that are, have large fleets. 
and working on how we can uh, move forward with moving from an uh, ICE or an internal combustion engine fleet to more of an EV fleet, at least in the initial stages of things. The other piece of this is our transition to zero emissions buses. As you know, John Ando is our administrator for the Mass Transit um, um, Agency in the county. And we are um, looking at, uh, he has done a good job in working with um, previous grants we had with the, the uh, Federal Transit Administration and, and the fact that they're funding a good portion of the buses that we're gonna be bringing in over the next few years. In addition to that, there is efforts right now to work on the, the idea of a public-private partnership using a private equity firm that will uh, potentially also allow us to move more quickly in the purchase of both EVs and hydrogen fuel cell um, buses um, that are coming online by manufacturers. Our ability to bring those in and develop the, the charging infrastructure associated with that is something that we see happening here in the next two to three years that quickly. I wouldn't say that. I've been in your seats um, and I hear folks from the government say, hey, it's only going to be a little while and we never believe them. The, the effort here is a two to three year effort to get, um, uh, at least for our mass transit agency, the charging infrastructure that's necessary for them to be primarily EV um, over the next maybe four to five years. We have, of course, well, we have, I don't know about of course, but we have a climate action plan. The first draft was done in 2020. We are in the middle of, or towards the end of actually publishing a final version of this, which will be focused on the county initially um, and the impacts uh, that the work in the county that we can do um, to reduce, become a net zero or even a negative carbon um, county. Uh, those are the efforts that we're taking a look at. What are the mitigating um, activities as well as the uh, adaptation activities that will allow us to do that? Um, that work is ongoing. There is a um, task force. There's a working group that our team both here in R&D and planning work with to um, um, work with both the values piece of this as well as um, moving forward with some of the activities that are going to make a difference as we move as we go. Tourism, big deal. We are um, connected with, and some of you are all part of this, our Hawaii Island Destination Management Action Plan, which is about managing regenerative tourism as a part of the effort that we have ongoing on the island. It is a leading way for the state. Um, and so um, there is a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. I won't bore you with all of the contract machinations and all of that stuff. The key is that from our perspective and the, the, the statistics show that show it right now is that we are back in terms of the numbers of um, domestic travelers that we have here on the island. Um, they are spending more than they did prior to the um, pandemic. So that portion of the economy is actually in a good shape. And we are also, and have been over the last two years, um, having conversations and developing conversations in some of our culturally and historically significant sites, places like Palolu Valley, places like um, Keokaha, um, already engaged in Pohiki um, by Isaac Holly um, Park, and then also down in um, down in the Greenpoint and South Point areas in um, Kau. Those conversations are um, either all uh, underway or about to be uh, worked. I didn't mention Waimea. Waimea is another location, obviously. So these are the kind of conversations that allow us to have bring the stakeholders to the table for conversations about um, what is the best way to make sure that both residents and visitors um, are, one, behaving in a Pono way, um, as well as making sure that those sites, um, whether it's lineal descendants or other stakeholders, um, that are associated with them um, also have a voice in the in the process. As the government, as the mayor likes to say, right? We we are building communities. Um, we we are building tourism around our communities, not the other way around. So um, the other piece of this is something that um, some of you that are engaged with community first are aware of. The uh, Kuleana Health Project is a um, U.S. Health and Human Services. Um, uh, grant that we received back uh, in the middle of last year, 2021, 
Um, and we are about a year, year and a half into it, or a year and a quarter into the work. It's about access. It's about making sure that health disparities in some of our more vulnerable populations is um, something that we're taking a look at, both at COVID-19 as well as chronic disease, chronic disease disparities. Um, these activities um, are engaging healthcare um, entities around the island. This is really kind of a first for us um, and so the use of the consortium lead by uh, Community First, along with the um, evaluation that um, is a requirement as a part of this grant by um, UH Hilo, um, we are making progress in understanding what the needs are. Um, this is in addition to the um, work that Community First is doing in terms of the access to care piece. Um, so these things are all um, working together to help us with making sure that we, we do have the kind of health care that our population needs as we move into the future. And okay, um, let me talk about this in a second and I'll talk about this in a second. Okay, so let's move out of that. See if I can do this correctly. All right, so let me, um, let me if I could briefly move out of that and let me see if I've got this piece right here. Um, uh, let's see this one instead. All right. All right. So this came from Gene Tian, um, who is the uh, the lead economist with DBET, um, and, and there are some other slides I have from him. But let me just give you a basic um what he sent us just briefly he briefed the four county economic development offices um, last friday as a part of our monthly meeting with dbet so as you can see we've got the four counties as well as the state total this is um the uh, contribution to the gdp in 2012 and so um at the time um you, you can see where this uh where we stood when it came to our gdp and then um, you know, the contribution of such a, as, a, as a part of that. In 2019, we take a look at um, this whole litany of industrial areas. So the red is the nominal um, and, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the, let's see, this is the dollars, this is the percentage. So red's percentage and the blue is the uh, actual billions of dollars. So, when, when I think about things, the, the dollars is nice, but it's it's actually, when we're thinking of diversification, we're thinking about what are the, the percentages, right? So if you recall from the previous slide, it was up only for a second, but tourism was about 25% of our, our, um, uh, our economy on the island. You can see here that at a good time for tourism in the state and on the island, um, we were about 16%. So we had already begun to see that there was some additional pieces associated with this. So obviously real estate, um, government has always been a large part of, of the island. Um, healthcare continues to be um, a piece of that. Construction in the 6% range. Um, and then you can see as there are other opportunities for us in all of these other um, industrial uh, or industry areas, industry sectors for us to be able to improve um, you know, relative to the big ones that we have here. And then um, jobs by industry, we see that, um, and I'll just point to this. So this one up here is uh, tourism um, because they didn't necessarily come all the way through. Government is in the neighborhood of about 10%. Um, and so we see the, if I go back here, um, healthcare related, this isn't necessarily showing up for me. Yeah, here we go. So government, federal government, uh, the healthcare side of things at about 9% of our jobs, um, retail about 7% of our jobs. So um, the jobs percentages don't always match completely with what our economy, this isn't a surprise to you that run businesses, but um, it is a, it is provides us an idea of what the jobs are um, in terms of the sectors that we have. So to the extent that we're able to improve the number of jobs and quality jobs that we have available um, in some of these other sectors, um, that will only help uh, the, the GDP side of things as we move forward. All right. And then finally, to, 
Okay. Let's see. Okay. So let me move this all the way back up here. So the um, let's see if I can do this. I'm a little scared to do this. So let's see what happens. So do you see two slides or do you see one slide? Yeah, okay. It is always fun to do this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just um, I'm just going to leave it with this. I know that you can see the sides slides here, but I'm just going to work with this the way we got it. So this is where we were, where we are in the recovery. And so this is Dr. Tian again um, last Friday. Um, and I'm going to tell you this, this is not necessarily, as I said to him on Friday, the information that he's providing just doesn't completely feel right. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So world growth project projections, you see 2020, 21, and then eventually into 2023. So obviously the recession in 2020 and then a big pick back up in 2021 and then back into more of the, the recessionary because of the inflationary, um, because of inflation, the impacts that, that we're having on, on our economic growth projections. Um, next, this is for the state, a lot of eye chart information here. Um, but the, the piece here that is probably as important is um, when we take a look at the real GDP, which is uh, uh, constant dollars in 2012, we see an increase, you know, moving from uh, 2022 through 2025. Um, the employment rates beginning to um, uh, still stay down, still stay low. Um, despite the fact that we also have this problem with the number that we have in the labor force. So the recovery piece is January to July of 2022 as opposed to January, July of 2019. And then across the top here is the state and then the variety and then the, the counties. And so if you look at the middle line, which or the middle column, which is the county of Hawaii, you see that um, if it is above, um, uh, if it is a Let's see, how did he do this? Yeah, if it's a, um, above 100, that's actually a good sign, right? And so you can tell compared to the other counties, we're actually looking relatively good according to the data that, that DBET has. Um, so um, employment, you know, close to 100. So this is relative to um, the, the pandemic piece, right? The pre-pandemic piece. Um, Non-ag payroll jobs, a little less in terms than what we had previously. Um, we have more unemployment claims than we did back then. That's why that number looks like that. The value of our private building permits, 171. Um, as was pointed out at the time, what we also have to take into account is that we were also coming out of um, Kilauea eruption in 2018, right? And so some of the impacts, particularly on some of these, um, both the jobs and the values, um, the value of real estate is going to have, there's going to be some impact um, where we were lower in 2019 than maybe some of the other areas were. So there is that um, piece to take into consideration as we, as we move forward. Uh, the payroll job count, um, we still have around 2,600 jobs that are lost. So this is um, relative, this number right here, this is relative to the 2019 time period as well. Um, and then you can see based on the variety of sectors, if it's over 100, we're better than in 2019. If it's less than 100 um, relative to 2019, that's, that's kind of where we stand. Um, so in hospitality, which is a big driver for us, obviously 97%, it's not bad. However, if you go talk to the resorts, they'll tell you that we're in the neighborhood of between um, close to a thousand jobs that are still not filled that they that they could fill, um, and so that's a that's a that's a pretty large number. Um, that's an eye chart. I'm just going to move out of that, and then um, the real piece here to talk about is so this is an analog the general excise tax liability by county. Uh, first quarter 22 compared to first quarter 2019, which is a pretty good year. You can see that everything relative to 2019, with the exception of theater and amusement, is above 100%. Uh, 
meaning that we're doing better now in terms of the um, GET tax liability than we were doing in 2019, which is to the economists a sign that if we're not recovered, we're really close. And yet, I don't feel that way. Uh, let's see. Let's keep on going. This is Honolulu. And then there's Hawaii. Again, um, this is just a change from 2020 to 2019 and then 2021 from 2019 as well. Um, and so the same information that we saw previously, um, the numbers are just a little different. Maui, Hawaii. All right. And then uh, I think you're all pretty familiar um, from our the, the air visitor recovery. We've, as I said, we've met our domestic numbers. Um, the international numbers are very low because uh, many of our um, visitors are from Japan, and Japan is just beginning the process of allowing, not just allowing their people to go, that was already okay, but come back without having to necessarily quarantine. So that was the thing that was delaying Japan's re-entrance into um, the visitor uh, numbers that we have here on the island. Um, but from the perspective of our air visitor recovery compared to 2019, you can see Hawaii Island here on the bottom. Um, we've been doing well um, over the last, uh, since really the spring of this year. And let's see if there's anything else safe. Yeah, and, and so I know that the realtors actually know this way better than I do. Um, so we've uh, had a little bit of a retrenchment um, since the, the high peak of um, the uh, real estate boom that we saw out of 2020 into 2021, but the numbers are still, um, they're not as high as what we see in the other counties, obviously, when it comes to the, the home values, but they're still um, re reasonably high. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the questions that does get um, asked and gets talked about is who are buying these homes? Um, and so just for the purposes of information, um, we see that in 2012 in the county, we had about 60% of home sales uh, in the first six months were um, locals. And then we had about 35% were mainlanders and then about 5% from, from international on the island. And then you see uh, uh, the other counties and then the state's um, side of things. Interestingly, the other counties actually are showing um, numbers that are similar or higher for local purchases um, as opposed to mainland purchases, but that is not necessarily the case for Hawaii Island. Um, we see that our mainland, our, that our local purchase is just slightly less, but that our mainland purchase um, in the first six months of 2022 of home sales was 5% higher than it was in 2012 as a relative term and that we've not had very many international um, purchasers at all uh, in 2022 for the first six months. So um, the key here is that I think that there has been um, a lot of talk about how it's all mainlanders that are coming to buy all of our properties. And this just shows that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do have some of the top states, but again, this is for the state and not necessarily the, um, the county. And Average prices, which is fine. Okay, so let's just, we'll be done with that. All right, so a bunch of eye charts, but also information that talks about um, where do we stand when it comes to recovery. And that last set of charts was interesting to all of us in economic development organizations across the state in the counties, because all of us were taken aback a little bit. We could, we could see, we knew what the unemployment numbers were. We knew that um, in uh, our tourism sector in particular, that there was, that, that the domestic um, uh, visitor had, was making a difference and in some degree was actually helping us in a lot of ways. And so um, the problem is, is that we still have more jobs than we have people filling them. And so we still have businesses that are not yet operating at an optimum number. And it's, so part of the question that we asked also was, do we know how many people are operating um, with, uh, you know, that are, you know, have more than one job? And it turns out that we can get that information if you go to the um, DBET, to the state DBET's um, 
research website, they, they have a variety of inform, um, pieces of information in there. And those of you that have looked at that are aware of that. So a lot of good information in there. Interestingly, that information says we only see about 5% of the county's population, um, working population that are doing you know, two jobs or more. Well, that's just not accurate. We all know that that's not accurate. Um, I, I, I don't even have to, uh, we know that it's more than that. And so part of the reason for that is because the collection of the information doesn't collect um, outside of the standard industries. And, and so if you are a gig economy or a garage economy of some kind, or you have started your own business, which in a lot of cases has been the case um, during this time period, that data does not get taken into account when we're taking a look at um, some of this information. So I, a little bit of this is inside baseball. I, I apologize for that, but I think it's important. Maybe it's important to me more than it is to you. When I'm trying to look at where we are as an economy, trying to figure out what we're being told by the folks that are collecting the data and then doing the analysis is important because if in fact they're not collecting everything that we think they need to be collecting and we're seeing different um, information than what they're seeing, then it makes you question, you know, can you trust anything that they're giving you? And I would tell you that the stuff that you're seeing that I showed you, yes, I think we can trust that, but it's not the whole story when it comes to what our economy looks like here on the island. And you know that we have, to some degree, we have, um, not, not surprising, I'll say this, we, we really have two economies, right? We have the economy on the west side and we have the economy on the east side. Um, I think that if somebody pushed me, and nobody's pushing me, but if somebody did, I would say that our economies are beginning to, at least out of COVID, we began to see that there was a cold, um, kind of a, a, um, a, a, a integration of those economies, that there was a little bit more of integration. That may move away. It may be that we begin to see more of a separation, but at the moment we're seeing that. And part of the reason for that is because we have so many new businesses, so many um, individual businesses that people started up over the course of 2020 and 2021. Um, and that happened around the island. So that actually added into the idea that our economy is becoming a little bit more networked and integrated. But we don't have great data on that necessarily to help with that. Um, I, I, even, even our friends in SDBC, I don't think necessarily have that. But I'd be more than happy for Judy to tell me more. Um, I think uh, the other piece of this is what we're trying to do as a county. So. I didn't, I didn't stay on the ARPA funds very long. Maybe I'll, uh, well, I won't necessarily go back to that directly, but let me just tell you that um, we received in the, um, in the county, we were fortunate in that our population was just over 200,000 in the census of 2020. What that meant was, is that that was kind of the cutoff for funding from the American Rescue Plan Act in the state and local fiscal recovery fund that, that acronym that goes by the, the very fancy title of SLUR, um, uh, which is why I call it the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund because nobody understands the other. Our ability uh, to receive funds directly from the federal government has been helpful. It is not nearly the same amount as what Honolulu has. Um, and Honolulu took a little bit of time to, to move out on what they're doing with that, but they're beginning to as well. And we have as well on these funds. Part of the reason is because we know that the amount that we received, some of that was used for civil defense purposes pretty quickly, um, not a surprise. But we also are looking at our economic revitalization um, elements um, as a part of this. And what we're looking at in that regard are how can we improve um, the ability to get our labor market back into the swing of things. And part of what we see as an impact on our labor market is the fact that we have um, a good portion of the labor market still involved in um, either childcare or kapuna care um, and not necessarily being able to work um, at housing. And largely that, uh, to a large extent, that turns out to be our female workforce. So we have, we have seen that we have not necessarily gained back all of the female workforce that we had um, on the island. Um, and so we're looking at ways to improve our childcare 
um, and early childhood um, support. This is largely a state function, but the county is entering into this because we think that there is work that we can do that can help our economy as well as help um, our families. We're also going to be working on, uh, we've put some money against already um, broadband capital infrastructure. Um, so the what we're working on there is that we have a variety of places around the island, not a surprise, that um, do not, that, that are not a part of the broadband um, uh, universe, if you will. We believe that we need to get there. We know, in fact, that universal broadband has to be a part of um, the island's infrastructure moving forward. And so we don't have a lot of money, but we're certainly going to leverage what we have to support um, work in uh, supporting our first responders in particular. Um, so civil defense, um, uh, uh, fire department, police department, emergency management services, all of the, making sure that those all are connected the way they need to be connected. We're very fortunate that we're just finishing now the, the, the um, fiber ring that we have around the island. Um, that, that is in the process. If it isn't completed now, I'm never quite sure, but if it isn't completed now, it will be very shortly. The last portion being between the National Park and, and Pahala. Um, and then that has done a number of things. It creates um, a redundancy for us that's necessary um, to make sure that we can then reach out to some of the branches that need to um, be connected, particularly um, areas such as our parks and recs facilities that are serving as emergency shelters um, you know, during uh, civil defense emergencies of one kind or another. Uh, and so we're putting some money against um, that with the priority being on the remote locations. Uh, there is some nuance associated with this. According to our Department of Information Technology, we have to be careful that we don't just willy-nilly put everything out to remote locations because not all of those locations, um, if they are in fact cut, um, will respond in the same way. In some locations, if they are cut, um, it has an impact on the entire system. And so we don't necessarily want to do that. So we're being careful about how we move forward with this, but we've already started in that process. Um, digital literacy is a piece of the funding that we're going to be going um, after as well. Affordable housing. Um, affordable housing is getting funding from a variety of locations, but this is another location because it's so important. We know that if we can resolve quickly quickly being a relative term, but if we can resolve quickly the issues associated with affordable housing um, for our workers, we know that that will have an immense impact on the availability of labor force, which will have an impact on the ability of businesses to grow. So right now, that's part of the problem. And then, um, and then finally, we have some funding that we're gonna be using, particularly for our mental health concerns associated with our young people. Um, coming, out of the, coming out of the pandemic, um, it's just, and, and for us on this island, also coming out of the eruption, frankly, um, in some parts of the island, uh, we know that this is a major concern. This is an upstream effort, making sure that we can try to address these things. So we are working with folks in the Department of Education to see how can we partner with them with some of the funding that we have available so that we can um, help, um, you know, help our young people in this regard. So that's some of the funding that's, that um, we, we see coming from the federal government. There is a whole lot more coming from the federal government, particularly in infrastructure, um, whether it's American Rescue Plan Act, whether it's the um, bipartisan infrastructure law, um, or whether it's the most recent Inflation Reduction Act. All those have uh, provided opportunities for us uh, that we are um, reviewing and trying to get um, connected with uh, so that we can bring some of that funding in. So the Build Back Better Regional Challenge was a portion of that out of the ARPA. Um, so we did get 500K out of that that is in contract. Those contracts will be done and reports finished and, and, and provided by the end of this fiscal year. We'll be using that information to then go after other funding that's available, whether it's USDA for our agricultural or um, it's EDA for some of our wastewater um, elements, or it's the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law for a variety of the infrastructure, particularly broadband, um, that we're working with the state on. So with that, um, if it's okay, Miles, I will open up. Um, I didn't plan on taking 40 minutes, but you know me, I can talk forever.
Uh, so, um, Jackie. Thank you, that great presentation. So two questions. Um, first question is, will you be responding to the USDA's um, request for proposal under the $550 million for underserved um, farmers, including Native Hawaiians? That's the one that just came out out of the IRA, yes? Right. Right, so we will take a look at that. Part of the concern we have, so the answer is, we would like to, um, but we do need to take a look at what the requirement is. Um, I believe that we are eligible. That's always the first cut for us. Um, and then this, and then the next part of that will be, does that fit in with, is what they're looking for fit in with what we've already, you know, kind of put together or need to modify? Um, I would tell you, I would tell all of you, we look for opportunities to include um, a HHL as a part of whatever is going to be done, or we will tell them about the things we find so that they can on their own necessary, uh, perhaps being able to apply. But what has happened um, is that in um, a variety of the grant um, opportunities, whether they're the notice of funding opportunity or funding opportunity announcements, depending on the department that's putting them out, they are using the terminology that's in statute that does not list Native Hawaiians um, as a part of the tribal um, elements when they're talking about the, the eligible components, um, the, 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 the entities that can be eligible to apply. And so this is an issue that we are bringing up with our congressional delegation because we think that that is an unfair disadvantage um, for um, the state, but in particular for the island, given the amount of land that we have that is um, you know, HHL land. So um, we want to include, um, you know, our, uh, we, want, we want to include the native Hawaiian population as a part of this. We think that it adds to the competitiveness of the applications. Right now, we, we are unfortunately in a good number of cases, not able to include them. Great, thank you. And then the second question I have is, I notice a lot of um, funds are going to our young people, which it should for behavioral and mental health concerns that came out of both the pandemic and the natural disasters we've experienced. I'm wondering if there's any collaboration um, to get some of the funding for our healthcare workers. Many of them are starting to demonstrate PTSD and you know, overload and so forth. So I'm wondering if anybody's addressing that. Um, I am not privy to the conversations at the moment about the work the healthcare community is necessarily doing on that. Um, when I was, that was a concern um, that was expressed with, you know, what the unions were doing, um, as well as what at least the, the state um, HHSC was doing. Um, so that's a good question. I'll have to follow up on that. I don't, I don't know where um, that's being taken or whether or not there's specific funding. I, I believe HHS has some funding that they're putting out to support healthcare organizations um, in, uh, in that, but it isn't something that I have been focused on, frankly, because it's not, it's a state issue, so. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions for Doug? Hey, Mary. I, did, I wanted to thank you for having real estate sales as a, you know, a line item in some of your report. Um, there's been some discussion about, um, we were reading that SEDS report, um, you know, that one that you sent us, Jackie, I guess it came from you guys. Um, and I don't, please don't anyone take this personally, but, um, the, I, I don't believe, and many people in the real estate and banking industry feel that the real estate industry is not getting enough credit for what we did to keep the economy alive in the last two years. Um, and um, the, the number of us that chose not to file for unemployment when we could have qualified and we lived on our savings. And now as we see 
market shifts and things, we wish maybe we had that savings at a higher level than we do. Um, it's just, um, there's a lot of discussion uh, around that arena. And so I just want to throw it into the economic development discussion. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Let, let's, let's have that conversation briefly. I, I think that, um, I think you're right. I don't think that the real estate um, organizations or the industry necessarily got credit um, for helping, just as I think the federal government probably didn't get help for making sure that we didn't necessarily um, fall down into a 2008, 2010, or a 1930s situation. Um, because folks had been necessarily, particularly in the 1930s, a lot of folks didn't live through that. They don't understand the, you know, what the possibility of that happening could have been. Um, and so that just wasn't in their, their connection. And so I, in some way, I would agree that, or I would, I would make the comment that um, the work that you were doing to some degree was um, hidden um, from us. And the idea that, um, that that continued a, a churn of, um, of the economy that needed to make sure that we had a multiplication factor when it came to our economy um, isn't something necessarily that anybody but our primary economists probably were talking about. I, I'm pretty sure Paul was talking about it. Pretty sure Gene would be talking about it. But they also, but it kind of gets lost in the conversation about um, tourism, the visitor industry and its impact. Um, so I appreciate your comments um, in that regard. You do know that, of course, there's always consequences. And so to some degree, the, the, the churn that was created as a part of the efforts that were made, um, we are, it's having an impact on the availability of rentals, which is having an impact on affordable housing too. If that's incorrect, by all means, let me know. Uh, I wouldn't say that you're wrong, but I think the more important factor is to look at um, the availability of, you know, the availability of availability of rentals is due to the lack of inventory. Yep, that's and more common. Thank you for that. that are, yep. People that are uh, choosing to live in those homes. Um, when you, I appreciated your little bar, uh, the little buildings of Hawaii versus mainland versus foreign um, participation. I'd be curious to see how many of those mainland purchases, particularly in East Hawaii, were local people coming home, but because the way that that data is captured, their address at the time of recordation is a mainland address. And so I think that the, the bubble, the, the little buildings are not really 100% accurate. Um, there's just been, especially since uh, the tech world is pretty much letting everybody work wherever they want to work. Um, as I long know as we I have broad down have access. Nine transactions, yeah. nine transactions in 2021 of local kids who came home. So, you know, I, I'm just one person. Yeah. Mary, mm -hmm. if I could just ask, um, would this is something we had tried to address in the SEDS? And if I could ask, it would really help if we could have individuals like yourself help us reframe part of the narrative. Okay. Because as Doug alluded to, the anecdotal information is what the storytelling in the community is all about. And so if you looked at the SEDS, we tried oh. to include that report where, you know, it says, yeah, it's not mainland buyers who are causing this. But if you could help us reframe that, we do want to make sure that the whole story is told. And I think you bring up a good point. So thank okay. you. Thanks. Anything else, Jackie? Okay, thanks. Matthias. Yeah, just to uh, Mary and Jackie's point on this other thing that I've been doing where I go door to door a lot <laughs> and literally hundreds of houses per week. It, you know, that um, that footnote that there is a lot of people who have moved back. I get that a lot. People are like, oh, yeah, nice to meet you. You know, I grew up here and we just moved back and I brought my husband or my wife or I get actually what I, I would say easily half is people from Honolulu moving here. 
So um, those are two distinct trends that, I mean, of course, I'm only here in a certain part of Hilo, Kalmana, Waikia areas, but it's interesting that that does come into conversation frequently. Thank you for the data point. So, I, so I'm gonna ask a question. I would be interested in comments. Do you all feel that we, we've turned a corner on, the, on our economic recovery here on the island? Am I too pessimistic about where we are, um, particularly as I take a look at um, folks that are working more than one job, um, the quality of the, the job, meaning, you know, not just its pay, but that's a p piece of it. Um, uh, the, the fact that, um, you know, we, we still are not filling all the positions that we can because we, we have a labor force that is lower than the number of jobs we have. Those are things- I'm, I'm gonna jump at. in real quick because yeah. this is the same thing I felt about COVID. We all experienced the pandemic together but we experienced it differently. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing pockets of individuals who are thriving. And yet we're seeing some of our most vulnerable becoming even more vulnerable as we're moving forward. So again, um, that my answer is yes and no. It depends on who you're looking at. And I think if you look at our impoverished and our Alice families, they'll be the first to tell you that they're still struggling. Toby, what are you seeing on your end? Because you hire a lot of, you know, workers. And so I'm wondering how you're doing and trying to fill jobs because it looks like you're struggling a little bit because I'm seeing bonuses in the paper and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Keith. I, I, I feel that um, we're, we're definitely short. I mean, we're shuttering hours. We're closing early. Um, you know, October 1st, you get a bump in um, minimum wage, which which not it's not a large bump. It just goes to 12, but but you're looking at a, an $18 an hour uh, max in a couple of years, right? And, um, you know, it's arguable. I mean, whether or not the economic output of a, of a sophomore in high school with zero job skills coming on is it has the economic output of 18 bucks an hour, I guess is debatable, right? Um, but, but, you know, we're, I think Jackie's spot on, right? I mean, I think that there's certain segments of our population that are thriving and certain that are not you know we talk about alice we talk about um i mean we, we you know we talk we talk about something like eot right electrification of transportation um how does that you know what are our plans for for an equitable access for for families that may not be able to afford an ev who may not be able to afford um installing that uh, charging apparatus in on their property. How does that apply to individuals working in or living in apartment buildings uh, and, and so on and so forth? So, so there's a lot of different questions I think comes comes up, but from a KTA perspective, I mean, we're struggling. We're struggling to, to keep, to keep uh, we're, we're about a hundred people short island-wide in seven locations. I could easily pick up another 25 FTEs in Hilo, another 20 in Waimea, um, and, and we're starting, you know, fairly, I, I wouldn't say, you know, it's difficult sometimes to compete against a, uh, for example, like I was talking to Craig Anderson, who's the GM over in Monarchia. He told me the exa exact same thing. He's short like 400 people. Yep, yep. Um, we, I can't start a person at 25 bucks an hour though. You know, we're starting at 16 in, in Waimea for zero job experience as a cashier, um, which is, you know, it's not for a first job with zero skills. That's not bad. But anything below that, you can't even get an application, right? And so I don't know, Keith. Did I? I don't know if I answered your question, but but you know, supply chain is going to be rough through the end of the year. Um, you see a lot of pukas on the shelves, um, and we're kind of fronting it out because we can't get the supply chain uh, right. Uh, it was the dre and the shipping before, but now it's components, right? So Gatorade can't find a cap. To finish making the flavor of Gatorade that they need, so that skew gets <laughs> pushed back, and, and so on and so forth. So, I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, I think that that's um, right. Uh, so I was just looking at the chat. Yeah, I'll send the presentation, the the one that I prepared for the HIR. I'll send that to to Miles, and he can send that up. Um, 
and I, I know Rachel has a, has a, her hand up. Let me just make this quick comment and I'll um, turn it to her. We're aware of, uh, we think about the equity impacts, right? And so that's part of the reason why there is um, a free Helion now. It's why uh, the mass transit piece of this is a big deal for us. We, we, we know that that has a potential impact around the island, particularly for the folks that are having to travel. That's why there's a focus that we're trying to put on childcare because we know that that is also um, uh, the impacts of not having that um, access to that um, or uh, even the funding to be able to do that um, it, it is much harder on our LMI populations, right? Um, and, and so when it comes to the EV side of this, you know, we're looking at even within the county, the ability to, as we expand the EV fleets that we have, maybe even making those available on the weekends as opposed to just sitting somewhere, um, you know, for um, some of our LMI uh, populations. The charging infrastructure piece is a big piece of this, and, and we've got some work to do on that, without a doubt. Rachel. Aloha. I just wanted to add in the discussion, and Doug, you and I kind of covered this briefly, it's also understanding um, those who are migrating out for economic and workforce opportunity. I know it's a data that, you know, we need to really kind of grapple and hopefully have that could really Tells, tell us the story. And on the other side of the coin too, is also understanding which jobs, because we don't have the skill set, um, our business partners have to hire from the outside. Um, and, and so see the gaps on that and how we can really support the hiring of local and, and what efforts we can do for that. Um, and, and beginning to get that understanding um, like, like Bonnie, you know, we are, of, of course, Bonnie has completed their strategic plan, but we are updating our strategic plan. And one of the things that um, we have done is also to work very closely with neighboring islands, Maui and Kauai, and we're doing a workforce survey as well to really help inform our programs and offerings. So hopefully that could also um, offer some information to all of us. Yeah, thanks. And thanks that migration that. was the was one issue that you know, with Hawaii Data Collaborative, we were hoping to see what they have to help us answer some of the questions about the migration and where they're going, what kind of jobs through they're, they're ending up when when they leave us. It is a piece of the pie that we don't necessarily have um, as much information as we'd like on, right? So that and and that and that that is true for I mean. I have on my notes here things to talk about data and being digitally um, progressive as a county is a big deal for us. We're so far behind. You all know this, and but we need to move forward. And so that's an effort that we're trying to make here is where we can, we're trying to be digitally progressive. Um, and uh, so it's just going to take a little while for us to do that. But there's so much data that's available. The reason I focus on that is because it provides a baseline. It helps with the messaging. It allows us to talk to um, our community. Um, and then it's in, within that dialogue that you begin to see, hopefully, um, uh, trust begin to develop. Because right now, we're not trusted as a, as a county by our residents. And part of how you get there is that you tell the truth. And you do it with information that is relatively near real time, if you can. Um, and you're only going to do that if you go digital as opposed to paper-based the way we are right now. So with all of that, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I see where we are in terms of the timeline. Um, and so I'll turn this back over to, to, to Keith. Thank you all for everything that you guys are doing uh, in your individual sectors and in the community areas that you are focused on trying to help with. Um, you know, we're doing our best. Um, I'd like to say that we're doing our best every day, but that's somebody else's tagline. So I won't use that, um, but um, we, we really are trying to um, move forward in a way that's going to allow our, um, allow the quality of life here to allow for thriving, particularly for the next generations. And doing that is gonna require focus on diversity, whether it's energy, whether it's creatives, um, whether it's ag, these are all areas that we have to, to focus on. Hey Doug, I got a quick question. Yep. Um, it has to do with your comments about data. I agree with you. There's a variety of data from unreliable up to super reliable. 
But the weak link in this process is that how you interpret the data, whatever you have, such that you can come up with ideas on what you need to do. So if we're talking about the diverse economy, is there, is there a group or individual or a consultant that um, takes those, that data and come up with ideas on what kind of uh, diversity we can have in our economy? And um, for, with that question, you know, diversity often we think about it as having new businesses within our community. But I like to include that diversity should also include existing businesses. How do we support these existing businesses to be able to um, do their uh, service or product uh, distribution better or to come up with new ways of using uh, their services and things like that? Yeah, thanks for that, Alan. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I would take um, issue with uh, one part of that, which is that the analysis is the weak link. I, 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 that's not what I've seen. Um, now I have um, specialists, economic development specialists in the variety of sectors um, that are part of them, but those are ones, right? Th these are ones, onesies that, that do this work, but they're very good at what they do and they're very connected to the community to the extent that they can by being individuals. Um, I, think that, I think you're very, uh, I think you're right on when it, you, you're talking about how do we um, support businesses that currently exist but you do understand that my focus is less on individual businesses and more on industry sectors, right? The idea needs to be, how do I make sure that our sectors are integrated um, so that the businesses that are part of those sectors are able to have the jobs, uh, ha have the labor force that they need so that they can grow um, and work with each other and across sectors. Um, that's where we see that diversification begin to, to really um, to work out. So. Um, we've got the folks, it's really about what are we collecting? Um, we can't just collect the same old thing. We have to make sure that we're collecting what we need, not just what's available. Uh, and so those are conversations we also have with the state. Thanks. I didn't mean uh, a weak link as something, uh, uh, as an insult or- uh, No, no, I, 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 didn't, I, I, didn't take it, I didn't take it that way. That yeah, way. what I meant is that uh, whenever you look at let me give you some examples. For instance, you know, we have a Silicon Valley in California. You know, how can we turn our island into a knowledge island uh, where we can have software developers from a variety of areas to come to this island to develop software, lock themselves up for a whole week and then be able to jump on a mountain bike or a kayak or whatever and, and expend all their physical energy and go back and soft, do software development again. Uh, how do we attract more retirees to this island such that we, instead of they all congregating in Honolulu after they retire because of their health services that are available there, you know, how, how can we do that? Um, uh, you know, you look, you look at the Banyan area, we always talk about how to put that all together. I went to a place called, uh, I can't remember the name, it's in Canada, but it, it, it's a place where there's, they call it, there's a name for it. And uh, there's a whole bunch of restaurants and uh, shops and uh, small little, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things. And um, I, you know, I look at the Banyan area and I think, what if we could develop that into call it the Banyan and have people congregate there, not only tourists, but local people can go there and, and uh, to go, you know, I'll meet you at the Banyan, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, we, we just had a report that they said that we import 90% of the food that we eat on this island. But the other question is how much of the food we did, we grow here, it gets exported uh, outside of our island. You know, that would be an interesting thing to compare because, um, if the food that we're growing here is not eaten here, uh, why are we talking about 90% of the food being imported here? Uh, healthcare, uh, we need to, um, you know, we, we just need to, uh, I talk, talked to Rachel a long time ago about uh, getting um, certified nurses assistance. And I noticed that it's taking traction now that they are having people uh, trained in becoming a certified nurses assistant. And they're a critical part between the nurse and the patient. And that's something that, you know, we, we need to do more of that kind of thing. So those are the ideas that come from the data that's gathered. And so that's what I meant that we don't, you know, it takes imagination, innovation, wild thinking, uh, unpopular thoughts, things like that has to come into the formula to come up with ideas and where the economy can go. 
So that's what I meant. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Alan. Um, I, I, I know where we are on time. I'll just make the comment that um, we are working on those and we're doing it in the way that you are asking us to do it. Thank you guys all for joining us and Doug, very important information. If there's anything that you feel like there's something that we as the chamber can be supporting you in, please let us know. You can either email me or Miles or call us separately. Uh, and of course, you guys all know how to harass Doug if you have more questions. But thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate it, Doug. You guys have a wonderful day and we'll be here next month. So Aloha. Thank, thank you, you, Doug. Thank you, Keith, for putting this together. Absolutely. Thanks, Doug. Take care, guys. Yeah.